So here back in ArcGIS, we're going to undertake a krigging of this particular data set. So again, we have Overbrook aesthetics here. And one thing we might want to check beforehand is whether or not the data is normal. Now for prediction krigging, it doesn't have to necessarily be a normal distribution, but if it is, then krigging will provide the best um, unbiased estimate of the prediction among all unbiased estimators. So if I right click on Overbrook and I'll just say create chart, I can look at a histogram. There's my histogram tool. And here in the histogram chart properties dialog, I click on number under variable and I want average index. And then it shows me the histogram here. And it certainly shows something which is somewhat maybe approximately normal in that it has we have low values moving up to high values and I'll just show a normal distribution on top of that. Low to peaking and then back down to low values. And of course that depends on the number of bins I have. I have 13 by default, I have 8, you know, 7 is 5. It can change the way that looks a little bit. 16, something like that. So the idea is you want something that's kind of normal like that or approximately normal. If it's not approximately normal, there are transformations you can take. So logarithmic transformations. If it's negatively skewed, square root if it's positively skewed, uh, as examples here. It can also show other, this is the median shown on there right now. So we have the median value. You can also show the mean, uh, the mean is shown, I'm sorry, then the median, purple line, and even the standard deviation. So that normality uh, is good. So we know that um, we'll probably get the best unbiased estimate with Krigging. So I'll close that for now and the chart properties. To look whether or not there's any trends in the data, so we're talking about trends as a function of the x or y coordinates, we can't do that with any tools directly or easily in ArcGIS Pro. But what we can do is go over to GeoProcessing and uh, yeah, add XY coordinates. And we'll add XY coordinates using the add XY coordinates tool to the Overbook Aesthetics. And I'll just click Run there. And that will add X and Y coordinates into the attribute table, like you see here at the end. Now I can look at a scatter plot of uh, point X, the X coordinates with the average index and the Y coordinates with the average index to see if there's any um, significant looking trends. To do that, I'll right click on Overbrook Aesthetics. I'll again go to create a chart, but this time a scatter plot. And for the X axis, I'll choose point X and for the y-axis will be average index. Uh, here we see. So right now what we see is um, a slight trend. It's not very, very significant. It's probably not significantly different from zero if we were to test it statistically. And it's a decreasing trend. So for, so for a given unit of x, there's a decrease in the um, unit of y, so the average index decreases as the um, x coordinate becomes larger. So in other words, from, from east to west, there's a slight um, decreasing trend in the um, average index values, but it's very weak. So you can see here that the slope right in here, and maybe I'll just blow that up, the slope of the actual line, the regression line that's on there is 0 0.0009. So that's very, very small times x. So it's nearly zero. So in this case, I'm not concerned with much of a trend in the x direction. What about the y direction? Well, I can just switch that up here to point y. And it's opposite, in fact. So this would look three-dimensionally. Um, as if you took a little flat peat like a wrapper and you twisted it in opposite directions. So if you took a piece of a wrapper, flattened it, 
brief foil wrapper and you twisted it a little bit in opposite directions between your thumb and index finger, that's what this would look like in three dimension because we have a, the opposite trend in the Y um, points, which tells us that as the Y values become bigger from top to bottom, there's a slight increase in the um, value of average index. So it'll become more aesthetically pleasing northwards rather than southwards. And if we look at here, if we just look at the, I can bring my mouse over top of the, um, over top of here, so I can see that um, equation once again, the equation line. It doesn't want to show up now. Ah, uh, there we go. So you can see the, again here, the coefficient of x, which is the slope, is 0 0.00000014. So it's insignificant. So we don't have to worry about trends within our data. Then, to undertake geostatistical uh, analysis interactively, we can use the geostatistical wizard. That's on the analysis tab, geostatistical wizard. And again, you have to have your, as mentioned, you'll need to make sure that you have enabled your geostatistical analyst extension. So this time, uh, last time we looked at inverse distance weighting, this time we want to go with Kriging flow Kriging. And then input data set is just one data set, Overbrook Aesthetics, data field, AVG, INDX for average index of aesthetics. And then we'll click next. Once we go next, then this is where we choose among our different Kriging techniques. So we have simple Kriging. That's when we know the mean ahead of time, which we don't in this case. So we'll take ordinary Kriging and we want to get a prediction surface. Universal Kriging, if we had a trend in our data. Unfortunately, in this version of ArcGIS Pro, you can't undertake any um, trend analyses to look for trends uh, in your data in three dimensions. So prediction, we don't need a transformation for anything or a trend removal for this data. So I'll click Next, and then it shows me a variogram, as well as a empirical variogram, and the minimum, maximum, and a few of the values within each of the bins that produced the blue points here. So let's make that a little bigger, like so. I can make the whole chart larger. So in the little, uh, in the semi variogram up here, you may see three little dots. I'm just going to turn off the show binned values just to see the empirical semi variogram, which is the average of the comparisons differences within those bins. Now the, the red dots are not the, when I say show, show binned values, these are not the, um, this is not the semi variogram cloud. ArcGIS Pro has no uh, means by which to show a um, the cloud that's used to get the blue dots. So the bin values, um, and it just if you hover over it even explains here, bin points, come over again, bin points show the local variation in the semi-viagram covariance values. So there's there just so the um, bin points are generated by binning and averaging. Oh, there we go. Oh, turn them all off there. Uh, averaging empirical semivariances and covariances using square cells that are one leg size wide. The semivariogram covariance cloud, the semivariogram model should pass through the middle of the bin values. And then it shows here average values show the oops, let's go back there let's get back show the angular variation in the semi variogram covariance values average points are generated data if we can actually get that on there to read it the whole thing 
same thing as before, fall within angular sectors, but we're, we're not working angularly here. We're using an isotropic measure, so the angular doesn't matter. And, of course, the model should pass with the middle of the average values. Uh, so showing those red dots just gives you an idea of some of the average variability around the blue dots, the blue crosses. But it's the blue crosses we're ultimately interested in fitting this model to. And the model right now is what's called a stable model. I can choose a Gaussian model, and then I can click up here to optimize that model. Or I could choose a um, another one, this might be spherical model here. And I can optimize that as well. Now, in this particular case, um, uh, the spherical one you'll notice here has a smaller nugget than if I choose the um, Gaussian model and optimize. So the Gaussian model then has a nugget over here, but then the differences decrease before increasing again. So the Gaussian model here is, a, is certainly somewhat biased by the first bin and its average location right here, so that average value, since it's really trying to pass through there. Now, most often, depending on the bin width, um, the first bin has the least amount of comparisons, differences, or points within the covariogram, within the semivariogram cloud that I showed you on the slide. And so it would have the least reliability, so it's probably not good to have it try and fit right through there. So I might go back to um, the, check that stable one again. Mm. Stable one is again ignoring that first one largely and trying to provide the best overall, even though that's large, the sum of differences between all the crosses and that model here um, is the smallest as a, as a positive belief for a stable um, equation. Um, and then I'll go back with the spherical like that. I like the spherical one. Um, because probably the nugget should be lower than that. It's just due to the lower sample size, lower number of points for comparison at small distances. And there's other parameters here, which you could read off. Um, that, that, like I showed you, we have the major range, 471 meters, being that range of spatial autocorrelation. The nugget, 0 0.09. So it's 0 0.09. Um, the lag size is 58. If we change that lag size, and again, that's the binning average, let's say to, to 60 or 70, then this is what we see. We actually get a much better fit. Well, that's optimizing again. So I want to put that back to 60. 60 gives a much better fit. Um, or no, 70 it was, I think, I put in there. So <clears throat> 70 there, you can see that it gives a much better fit to this rising part. So within the range of spatial autocorrelation, I think it's probably better like that, with the leg size of 70. Um, so I'll click Next. This is just like with the ITW, it shows the location you click on and you can see here in the identify results the location x and y value and the predicted value so it's using um, a maximum of five neighbors in the weighting and a minimum of two i'm going to put those to, to five and five or we can even go 15 to 15 if you want so we do have a slightly larger range of spatial autocorrelation here, you know.
And then for all of these, uh, if you look at that, for all the neighbors being considered, uh, you'll see all the weights here. And then we can click on next and to, we can assess the model fit here. So again, this is our predicted against our observed, the measured. The one one line is the gray line. So if we had perfect predictions based on the leave one out cross validation assessment here, if we had perfect predictions, we'd have everything right along that gray line. Uh, but of course we don't because there is variability. It's a statistical technique. Uh, distribution, again, that's just the measured distribution. You can look at the predicted distribution. Again, we've seen the same type of thing. Standard error distribution, which is interesting. Normal value measured. There's a normal QQ plot of the standardized error and basically you want everything to be on that line. There's little deviation at the end, probably outliers, but most of it's there, which is good. Um, here we have then a root mean squared error of 0 0.408, so it's very similar to what we got with IDW. Um, so the root mean square is 0.4 index units. And so I'll click finish now. And it gives you a summary. And again, you can see that summary by right clicking on the layer later and going to properties. And so then I, I'll receive my Krig layer here. So I'll just turn that off and now I can see this. It certainly more visually, um, visually looks nicer than the IDW one. We don't have bullseye effects everywhere. And it's slightly more generalized as well. So we can see a general area of low aesthetic values and then clusterings of high here and high here and then around the um, the river, all mostly high except a small uh, uh, few in here. And again, if I wanted to persist that uh, over to um, to to say match up with the all within the Overbrook neighborhood again, like we did last time, I'd have to. So if we want to persist the layer, then um, we'll just we can right click on the creating layer and we can say export layer to rasters and here it will give us a what were the input layer since that's already creating so that's, a, that's what we right clicked on what do we want to output the prediction um, the output raster and here I can call that um, AES interp pred. I'll call it AES for aesthetics underscore pred dicted. I'll put cell size five, fine, run. And then, of course, it's going to, because we have our environment set, um, it's going to put that within the extent of Overbrook, like you see there. Um, to examine the most important part of this is to examine not the prediction, that's, that's the map we want, but we want to also show the prediction standard error. So I'll also I'll output a predicted standard error, so I'll call it APS, AES underscore SE for standard error, and I'll run that. So there's our prediction standard error map. And you can see that close to the individual points where we have observations, we have low standard errors. So less than or equal to 0.19 aesthetics units. Whereas where we have less dense 
sampling, such as within these um, regions here that kind of look like gaps. Let's just bring that up over here for a second. So in these type of regions that we see here, where we have no samples, the standard error also go, starts to go up. And as we move further away, down, I'll change the color here to maybe yellow. So, we, so down here, as we start to move away, it almost looks like a beach, doesn't it? As we move away here from our sample space, the standard errors rise as well, because this is extrapolation. So those are extrapolation errors. And so close to our support, our data support, we have low error. Further away, we have um, less error. And that is very important when interpreting this map in that we don't want to interpret. Well, look at down here, for example. We have some very high values of aesthetics down here. If we were to interpret this map, the way you see it right now. But we know that that's extrapolation error. All the stuff down here is extrapolation. It's meaningless because there's no data to support it.